morning, everybody. We're at the COVID-19 transition committee meeting. Um, and Senator Nitka just kicked us off with asking the question, you know, sort of the process from here out. I guess uh, Senator Westman will um, give his thoughts as well. I should just start by mentioning uh, Senator Ash did, uh, we, we sent him a, a draft um, to let him know that uh, where we were at. And his only uh, comment um, was that we provide a little bit more of an introduction around, uh, you know, sort of the genesis of the committee, why, why we were doing this, um, just to make sure it didn't come off too much as, as just a, a list of, of legislative priorities. But again, just give some context to the situation that we're dealing with and how we're working on things related to the transition itself. That was his only comment. And then what uh, Rich and I thought we would do, which we did, was just send around, we incorporated additional comments from Debbie and Ruth and others. Uh, we made a few uh, changes um, and then we just sent around a clean draft to everyone. And I guess um, maybe in my, uh, I was hoping uh, that everyone would wake up to a bunch of emails that said, oh, I'm ready to sign on. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I don't think I got a draft. I didn't see one. When did you send it? Uh, yesterday. I don't believe Is I got it. Is it possible that I didn't send it to you? That would be odd. But I kept counting and going around the room. And so I apologize if that's the case. Um, anyhow, I'll look at that right now. And then what we were thinking about doing was, um, was again, just seeing who's comfortable signing off. You know, we'd ask uh, Luke to do final edits in terms of, so there's a consistency with language. So we don't all just sort of weigh in on, on, the um the style so there's one consistent style through the whole thing um and then um, um and, and go ahead senator west uh ruth wasn't included oh i apologize of course that was you know i just kept going over and over and it did seem to be honest a little odd i kept thinking here it comes ruth <laughs> Here uh, comes with, with my apologies no worries i wondered uh, and i didn't want to bug you guys but i was like i think i'm supposed to have this but oh no no you. you didn't have it it's like uh, i you know I, I just looked at the list it's not there shit excuse me <laughs> right well i'll read it back. after center alliance <laughs> yeah <laughs> health and welfare <laughs> committee man i know man <laughs> We'll come up with the infraction that, that caused it later. But, but. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, Rich, am I missing anything? Did you want to add? I don't know if you talked to Tim, too. It just sounded like I actually just got the vo a voicemail from him. Um, I think um, I think it would be good for us to, um, 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 in the front of it, put um, um, some more pieces about what and i actually think we should ask tim because tim asked us so a statement from him might be good yeah yeah, yeah that sounds like a good idea um but i think you know it's right now we're looking at correct me if i'm wrong rich really at content if we can all get to an agreement like a bill you know the content of this do we have everything? We'll look to ledge council for um, that sort of writing, consistent writing style. Uh, and I am, I'm not, <clears throat> I, I would like to get this out sooner rather than later, given that appropriations uh, and, and Alice and Rich know better than I, uh, is really starting to, to jump into all these kinds of things. I'd like them to have this uh, as well as other committees, so right. I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Well, I, I I actually agree with that. I think um, we know that there's a housing piece that um, was announced to all of us. That um, I think um, um, we to weigh in on. I um, also on Friday the um, the consultant for broadband will come out with their report appropriations. 
um, started on Thursday and Friday um, um, having discussions about um, the, the first quarter budget and will get the bill um, either tomorrow or Wednesday. So it's a pretty appropriate time for us to weigh in. Yeah. So uh, when you're ready for comments, I have a couple of thoughts. Okay. <clears throat> I think that, um, I think it really captured everything that we said. Okay. Some of the, um, you know, that maybe makes it a little bit too long. I mean, we said all that's in there and it was really captured, but I think maybe is there a way of, it's a big document for, I mean, if it was just going to Tim, that would be one thing, but it's obviously going to be used by a lot of places and that's good. A lot of work went into it. But I think, you know, for instance, on broadband, there's some places where I think we said the same thing twice. And I don't know if there's a way of um, <coughs> reducing some of that to not be redundant. No, I think that's fine. We can ask Luke absolutely to look for any re redundancies um, when editing. Absolutely. And there's just one piece that um, I'm, I'm viewing the document as something that we want to be, um, I guess the way of putting this is to be very productive and rather than alienate anybody because they something was said that somebody would find a miss. So on the piece that I wrote, just that one, yep. I know we had in the last meeting mentioned what judiciary had done, but Alice, you're breaking up a little bit, at least at my end. Committees had done a lot also. So I think just my thought of just saying about um, government operations started out and then leaving the part out about judiciary because I think the other, the very active committee in the beginning was um, economic development. Which if anybody deserves another accolade, they do in the very beginning. Then everybody was, healthcare was doing a lot, education, all kinds of committees were doing a lot. So I think just eliminating that piece about judiciary is like half a line or something. You mean the part where it said, uh, where judiciary had already advanced a number of things? Yeah, I, I don't have it in front of me because I okay. can't. Yeah, I remember putting that in, so I'm. I we can we can take that out. That out so that other committees don't feel, um, you know, that their work wasn't recognized. I think that's fair. Um, let's see. What else? Well, I don't have it. Is there a? Um, should we put it on the screen? Or you know, maybe others have some thoughts. Let's see. My, Myra probably could put it on the screen and we could see it. Don't know if she has it, but Luke, uh, if Luke would put it on the screen, that would be great. Myra, this is Luke. Can you make me a co-host, please? I think Senator Herney had a comment. Yep, I just did. Great. Ruth has got her hand up. Okay. Yeah. I'm just scrolling through it because I just received it, obviously. And I made quite a few edits at the beginning of the document and it looks like none of them were incorporated at all. Um, I did exactly what Alice just suggested about the broadband section, which was reduce redundancies and shorten that up quite a bit. I also made changes to the worker section because I, I remain very uncomfortable with what we say in that section and I can't sign on to this document the way it is. So I, I had made some changes to uh, soften that. So Luke, you said you could read my document, but it doesn't look like you incorporated any of my changes. And I'm not sure why. Uh, that might not be uh, Luke's fault. It's yeah. possible just because, you know, one of the things we've been struggling with is just getting multiple documents around. It's possible that they might have I'm not quite ready to put that on Luke. Uh, I just yeah, make... Senator Campion, can I jump in? I don't know Please. if everyone can hear me. It sounds yep. like there might be a little echo. So Senator Hardy and everyone else, uh, the changes that you sent, if I was told to incorporate them, I did. And for example, some people sent some things over the weekend. I had put that in a new draft that was not distributed. So... I'm not holding back on making changes. I'm not making editorial decisions. 
what I really did is try to incorporate the language I was sent, tried to make it consistent, added, you know, a little bit of introduction, a little bit of closing, but I've really been waiting on you folks to tell me what you want in the letter, either individually or collectively. And I'm glad to keep doing that, but I think I need guidance on what you want in the letter or what you want to change. So uh, maybe what we do then is uh, we will go ahead, unless there is objection, uh, if you would incorporate Senator Hardy's uh, edits and suggestions in a new draft, as well as what we've heard from Senator Nitka. So these are, Senator Hardy, are these the suggestions you'd sent in on your track changes doc that was a PDF? Yes, and, and you said yep. you had converted it to a Word document. Or the, yeah, that's the way we left it at the end of our last session. Yeah, right. so, so, we'll, so we yeah. will just, we will incorporate those um, as yeah, well as what Senator Nitka. So I, I have to say at this point, if the track changes are in there, they include minimum wage and, um, and the other pieces around that. And um, 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 I think we make the part, um, the document um, partisan. And we've already, as a legislature in the state, dealt with minimum wage. Are those yeah. what you're speaking to, though, Senator Hardy? I'm not sure. If well, I would, I would, um, Rich, thanks for saying that because I, I was just going to say there was one part of what I included, which was about the minimum wage and paid family leave that that Rich um, uh, felt uncomfortable with, and I I said that I was fine of taking that out. But That's right. so yes, thank you for saying that. And and mostly the stuff in the broadband was to do to tighten it up shorter. I didn't change the content. I just changed the tried to yeah. make it shorter. And then I did change the worker stuff to soften it a little bit. I think it's, I'm not comfortable with where it is right now. And I, there was a paragraph on paid family leave and, and minimum wage, which would be easy to not include. I, I would um, just also say in the broadband piece, I'm, um, um, most of um, Ruth's changes I agree with, she took some out about, and I think um, this reflects a feeling on the committee. Um, we have, um, in contracts up to this point, federal and state, um, incentivized businesses that um, have contractually came out, tried to do things, and we've ended up with um, less than satisf satisfactory um, finishing um, to that. Um, and um, we've had some companies and some contracts come. And I think that somehow in this document, we need to say that we need to work with people that bring stuff to the table um, and, and be better at those contracts if we're going to give contracts to private businesses that don't. There's a lot of community groups. There's um, um, some effort to include cooperatives now, but we have not contracted with people that produce the end product that has given us broadband. And that's a piece that I think we need to say in this document. And didn't, was that not said? Well, I. I, 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 I think um, that piece, I, I, I just want to make sure that that's in there. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah. I yeah, and I, if I edited that out, it wasn't intentional. It was just because I wasn't understanding the sentence correctly or something. Um, but I, I think having a strong statement of we need to make sure the contracts actually result in broadband access is well and, and and i and i think it's we've contracted with people that say oh i can do this but not really sure what they brought to the table you know um i think the the community groups bring a level of support and expertise in the communities that we need to include um you know and and many of us the the cooperatives are um are in places where there is not broadband now and they have the wires and the poles. 
and how we include that in what we do, I think is important. Yeah. I also, just looking through the document, I had made some edits in the section about marketing. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I can't remember specifically what I changed because I don't have that document up, but I've heard from a, a lot of businesses that, that they are underwhelmed and by the governor's proposal about marketing and that it just seems kind of fluffy. So I, I think there needs to be more uh, con uh more content to that proposal than just we're going to market for by local marketing. That's been done so many times. We need something. We need to. I try. I think I tried to emphasize the technical assistance part of it rather than the marketing part of it in my edits. Would you remind us, Ruth? Was that marketing uh, to just in-state folks, or is was this sort of um, just marketing the state overall? I think it was both. What, from what I understand from the governor's proposal, you know, the, I think he had some phrase about marketing Vermont to Vermonters or something like that. That's right. yep, yep. Vermont to Vermonters. And I think there are, there's a lot of skepticism about that and that, you know, putting a ton, you know, $5 million into marketing and, to, for that purpose may not be a good use of funds. Um, I do think there needs to be marketing, but it has to be combined with technical assistance. How do you make it through this crisis with, you know, business support, financial support, um, health protocol support, et cetera, all of that, and then marketing too, but trying to really combine the technical assistance and marketing. Well, and one of the things uh, <laughs> and I talked about over the weekend, um, not to get too much into the weeds of this, but, you know, one piece that, you know, could be worth marketing is, again, our institutions of higher education. I mean, marketing right now out of state to say, come to Vermont for a vacation is, no, you can't do, it's irresponsible. It's, it's right. not really what, what we're doing, but to come and think about our institutions of higher education where you, again, it would be weird to say these are, you can't say these are safe places, but you can talk about uh, the rural communities, the culture, you know, sort of let people put, you know, if you're living in New Jersey or somewhere like that and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go to the local state college where it might, you know, be 10,000 students or 7,000 students compared to a Johnson or a Linden. Um, mm -hmm. it, that, that, kind of, that kind of thinking would be interesting, but that's probably a little bit too into the weeds, but I think it would be a good thing for us to have a conversation with that department as they move forward with marketing. Well, I, and I would say that um, in what the governor, it isn't clear to me that as you do that broad marketing, that that won't just help, you know, for example, large resorts. I'm most worried about a small inn that has five or six people and below working for it, or a small right. um, restaurant. And I want to, uh, the big guys will, they, they've got the resources to figure that they've got marketing departments. They, uh, it's the small businesses that I think um, don't know what to do and they, um, and they don't know how to come out of the box. And so that is the piece that's most important to me. That's true. Uh, also, should there be some mention of working with the Chamber of Commerce, you know, who are still, who are around the state trying to get the small businesses uh, back on their feet? So I don't, I don't know if that would be I mean, I would think uh, just personally, I would think that that would be a, a group that they would naturally go to. Um, I'm not sure if you would think so, but I they haven't always. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, in past years, they haven't always worked as closely with them as might have been. Um, I mean, Ace, I have to admit, I think that shop, Lindsay Curley's place is doing a great job. But um, I don't know if that would be something you just mentioned as, as supportive of them and that relationship. Alice, would you be comfortable if we said something instead of just calling out one group, but more saying with, um, you know, uh, 
various partners, something like, because I'm just thinking our downtown organization, oh, incorpor you know, something like that. Oh, that'd be good. Maybe Luke could find a language that, again, was, you know, with our, um, with the necessary partners or something like that, with a broad range of partners. Um, that would be good. Okay. Because I think I, I know what you're saying. And yeah, you hate to see certain groups left out. Um, and I just think there are a lot of small little downtown associations and regional associations and the chamber that um, could all be a part of it. Just to go back to the, we can't see Ruth's comments on the work. Yeah. I do want to mention in the work, I thought there was a paragraph there where, where we were not condoning, but is anyone else having difficulty hearing Alice, or is it just me? Uh, I no, she's going in and out. Okay, Alice, you're just going in and out. I don't know if it's okay, something Alice. banging. Yeah. Or if those grandkids have been fiddling with the computer. Yes, the child does Zoom on it for his school. <laughs> Everybody should mute because it could be other people's. Oh, life. that's a good point. Thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. So anyway, just on the worker piece, and maybe Ruth has included this already. I thought the part where we mentioned people returning to work, um, I think we shouldn't show like um, the piece about it looked like it was okay with us that people were saying they wouldn't return to work just because they were getting more money. And which I agree, that's what some people are saying. But in fact, if they're offered their job and, and let them have an issue with childcare, I think they, um, you know, they need to be returning because that's, if you're asked to return to your job and they're operating, except for the reason if you have childcare or you're sick or something, um, you've got to go back. We just can't sort of slough it off that, not, not that we have to say they have to go back, but I think just change our wording there so that we don't get into that of, you know, saying kind of sort of sloughing that off and saying that it's okay if they don't go back. We didn't say it's okay, but <clears throat> just, I think just a couple of changes there. <coughs> so, I, I, I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are reasons why people can't go back or shouldn't go back. And part of that is, could be because of childcare reasons. It could be because of health or vulnerability reasons, elder care reasons. None of our um, elder long-term uh, daycare programs have opened yet. Um, and also I, I emphasized in mine is that, you know, it's, it is reasonable for somebody to say, I'm making more money this way and, you know, for, to expect higher wages, and that's why I got into the 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 um, the minimum wage thing. But just as an example, an, uh, my daughter's employer <laughs> is paying higher wages for as an incentive for people to return to work, and um, and saying, you know, I know that this is a risky time, and you feel uncertain and insecure, and that makes this job much harder than it normally is. So I'm going to pay a higher wage, and I, I think that's important to acknowledge that people feel risk, feel the risk, and that there are reasons why people are are worried about going back. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to stay home and, you know, suck off this unemployment or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I feel like we're getting a little bit into um, areas that, yeah, we could keep acknowledging all sorts of scenarios that people are going through, but I, I, I'm wondering if we're moving away from sort of the nuts and bolts. I mean, really employers at this point, if they're, and correct me if I'm wrong, somebody who's on economic development, but if somebody has a business, they reopen it and somebody is not, I, I don't know really what the kinds of protections that are in place right now uh, for employers or for employees, if they decide not to go back, if it is, if their business is back up and open, you know, I mean, can people say at this point, I have uh, an elderly parent at home that I need to still care for? I, I, I don't know the ins and outs of that. So um, I realize that there are situations that would preclude people from going back, but I, I don't know the, the legal ramifications. Um, 
That's Maybe somebody else does. Are you saying, Brian, you, you don't know the legal ramifications if they say that with regard to them continuing to receive unemployment? Right. For example, if uh, my employer said, OK, we're back open. The governor says we're back open. Things are things are you know transitioning back. And where is my flexibility as an employee? Do do am I still am I in a position where I can say, you know, I am not going to go back because of X, Y, and Z. I would think that the employer at this point, and I don't know, could say, okay, thank you, Brian, for your service, but we need an employee back. And we have now the state has recognized that we are either a, a you know business of necessity or we're transitioning back in such a way. I somebody can help me with that. That would be I, I'm just uh, I don't know where things are at this point with that. If the colleges, for example, if this were September and some and the colleges were back open and somebody still had, like Ruth said, child care issues or these kinds of issues or elder care issues, what are what are the institutions going to do? I, I don't know. I would think I, I'm not sure. So does that make sense? What I'm kind of struggling with, where is that employer employee relationship now with as things have opened back up? I don't know if people can. Well, it's the issue for those people of whether they'll continue to collect UI or not. Um, but if you're if you're dismissed from your position and I and this is what I'm just trying to figure out, if I if my employer were to say, well, you, we're going to get rid of your position, we are going to fire you, Brian, because. We have to, we have been told that we can open up. We appreciate that you have issues with an elder, you know, parent or something, um, but we have to run our business. You know, can, can an employer say that, you know, as things open back up? I would think so, but it's UI where the decision will made as to whether they will be able to continue to. Right, but if I'm terminated from my position, yes, you'll continue to get UI, but I, I guess I'm trying to understand what, Where are you? yeah. Right. But that, that's a question that we probably aren't going to figure out here in the next few minutes, but we should perhaps ask someone who knows about unemployment how to wrestle with that. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that we're not, that the language that we are, we might be putting in here is cognizant that, you know, or, or showing that, you know, again, things are opening up. There might, that worker sort of work, you know, employer employee relationship might be changing now. That's all. Yeah. yeah, Senator Campion, this yeah. is Joyce. Oh, great. Uh, I know that economic development was talking about a bill back in March that would protect people who, who were living with other vulnerable people so that they did not have to go to work if they felt that it was too risky. I don't know if that bill actually passed, and I think it, it provided protection during the governor's state of emergency, which now ends June 15th. So I can try to check on that bill. And that would be helpful if you would check on that. That would be great. Thank sure. you. Yeah. And Brian, I just want to add, I, yeah. um, I think this is an issue that, you know, we might want to mention, I don't know, but that there are these complexities because this actually has come up with the reopening of childcare facilities yeah. and um, childcare programs have asked, you know, specifically in the protocols for childcare programs that says the vulnerable people or people over 65, if their workers should not come back and provide childcare. So I've had childcare programs ask me, what am I supposed to do with my workers who can't come back? I yeah. don't want to fire them. It's right, not right. their fault, but I also can't keep paying them. And so I actually asked yep. CBD this question and they're working with ACCD for guidelines for childcare programs. Okay. And I would assume it's similar for colleges and universities and probably for restaurants and hotels and everybody. Um, it's a complicated thing though. And, and I think acknowledging the complexity of there are workers who are not gonna be able to come back and that puts both the workers and their employers in, in position. an awkward yep. position. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So you feel as though you would say, even though you've mentioned it, it it's a whole, it, you, you wouldn't mention it. That's fine. Hey, that Brian, that I, yep. Brian, I think in this document, and, and I'm going to say this for everybody, it's not our attempt here to come up with the solution. It's our attempt to say we need to come, the legislature needs to come up with a package of ideas, whether it be um, financial, whether it be policy changes, what are the things that we need to do and to put a light on the fact 
that this is an area where we're hearing um, we're hearing a lot of people um, having issues around this. Yeah. And well, we as a legislature need to look at this. And so, you know, I'm glad we're having this discussion and the, we aren't going to come up with a solution in this document. But if we don't put a light on this, um, I think we're making a mistake. Sounds good. Yeah. <clears throat> and we did do that when we talk about our working group suggests that any disincentive to returning to work should be gradually eliminated in a manner that supports out of work for modernists while ensuring businesses can get up and running again. We're basically laying out the idea this is where we have to go, but we're not going to be able to decide on the specifics in this kind of conversation right now. Yeah, and that, that needs to be the Economic Development Committee that has a hand in that, but right. let's create a path for them to get there. Yeah. Let me just check in for a moment. Uh, Luke, do you have a good sense up to now what we would like uh, before we move on, <laughs> where we're at, what changes we would like, and what um, we might anticipate in a second in a, another draft? I do. I think it's, there's some um, disagreements in the committee. What I'll do is try to incorporate what you've mentioned. I've been taking notes, um, and I'll kick it back to either the co-chairs or to all of you, whatever you prefer, to look it over. I'm sure there'll be some further wordsmithing. So uh, just want to let you folks know it will take a little bit of time because we have multiple drafts now. I've got a lot going on today, and editing also has a lot going on today. So it won't be a very, I'll do everything I can to get to it today, hopefully finish it today, but it may take some time. Just want to let you folks know that. My policy has been to send it to everybody but Ruth, but that's just. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, um, I have one. Uh, Thank um, you. Suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> I have one suggestion in the higher ed piece. Um, we um, um, have pooched out the idea of that we're going to have the 20% decline in higher education and we end that piece um, um, on the second page of the higher education place. Uh, we must increase scholarship appropriations by at least 5 million for, um, I really think in that Knowing that we're going to uh, that nationally they're they're predicting a twenty percent drop in the number of students starting this fall, and it will be a blip for a short time. That we really need to have um, a comprehensive idea in a plan, and that may be a strategy that has a number of pieces to it. But we as a legislature need to develop, um, and as a state, need to develop a plan around that drop to in the immediate to get our schools through that. We shouldn't be closing school just because you're going to have a one year or, or an 18 month drop in students, we, because the schools need to be there for the long term. And so it isn't just give 5 million more. We need to think of a plan. Yeah, um, Rich, I, I agree. And I, I think I do say, I don't have a dollar amount, but I do say in here that um, I emphasize the having the plan and also having uh, mm -hmm. longer term financial support for institutions of higher education. But I can say, I mean, while well, Luke can edit it to make it more to, to explicitly say we don't think closing campuses, especially now, is the answer. Well, and you know, I'm I'm thinking, you know, maybe we do something to give um, students more aid. Can we re regroup our efforts around the marketing of our own schools? You know, I gotta believe there's people out in more urban areas in the country now and particularly in the Northeast, that's within a drive of Vermont, that they'd rather drop their kids off here than um, um, someplace else. And um, I, I think we've got something to sell. That could all play into that. But I don't get the feeling we have a comprehensive plan to 
or any um, ideas to deal with a 20% drop? Senator Westman, this is Joyce again. So uh, this week, the, the legislative sponsored report by Jim Page, the former chancellor of the University of Maine system, will come out that talks about the bridge funding that's needed for the coming year. And that report contains some um, scenarios about uh, drops in enrollment and so forth, and how much would be needed to support the system in light of that. And also the, the House is working on a proposal that would be a long-term study of the viability, the financial sustainability of the, the public education, public higher education system in the state as a whole. So those, those two things are underway and um, you'll be hearing so, about both of them soon. So, so, you know, that backs up, this document ought to be the lead in for those. Sure. I think that's a great idea. And I'm sorry, I, I thought I had incorporated some language in it last night, Rich. Uh, yeah, you, I, think you, I think you did, Brian. But okay. it talks, um, currently, um, we allocate $20 million to um, um, student scholarships. We must increase those scholarship appropriations by at least $5 million. That's the only thing we talk about. And I think this is a bigger issue. Yeah. And really, we need to be comprehensive about it. And this document needs to say, we know we're going to have a drop this fall. That, what are we going to, what are we going to do? The last paragraph um, does say su sufficient state funding to weather this storm and survive the long run. I did not put a dollar amount on it and it, it cause I don't know what that dollar amount is. And I think saying uh, what, uh, what Joyce just said, I think is, is, is a helpful just, uh, you know, pointing to those coming reports um, yeah. with, and, yep. and saying, you know, whatever. I also thought I had a line in here, but I'm rereading it about um, exactly what you're saying, Rich, about marketing Vermont as a, as a quote unquote safe place to come. That actually, I had, I've had several conversations with the people who are working on this at the state level. And that is part of what their thinking is, is to say, hey, look, mom and dad, this is one of the safest places in the country, or if not the safest place in the country to send your child to to college now. So I'm using that to our advantage, but also making sure that when those students come, they understand that if you're in Vermont, you need to follow Vermont's rules about how we are dealing with the pandemic, because that's another concern. Very good. Just, just while we're on those two paragraphs, I see the, the first words in all of, all of the college and universities, and someone's underlined that, which is good because it speaks to an issue that I noted also, and then in the next paragraph, these institutions must be provided with sufficient state funding. I'm not comfortable with that. It looks like somebody else highlighted that because it looks like it refers to all of the colleges and universities, which I, I don't believe we're speaking about that because we're not going to be providing state funding to say Bennington or Middlebury. I would want our state colleges to be have sufficient funding. Okay, so that, this, that should just, narrow that down uh, so that it clear, it's clear that we're talking about our state colleges to provide state funding to, not all of the colleges and universities. I, would, I actually think we should mention the idea that we may need to look at different kinds of funding strategies for the state colleges. I mean, this idea that we're just going to keep giving them money, which I'm not opposed to, but right. Right. So maybe there's a more creative way of going about how we fund state colleges than just writing them a check. Right, and you know, one of those things might be that um, we help them um, um, recruit um, more students from out of state to come here. Sure. Um, we need to fill that. So um, maybe we take um, um, and have more um, help fund recruitment. Off. I'm just throwing out, but we need a package of ideas and we need to be thinking about what this is because we know the problem's coming. Right. Maybe it's um, rich. Rich. Yes. Uh, the um, one of the themes that keeps coming in here is that Vermont's a safe place. Um, the the report in Digger two weeks ago about house sales was a uh, kind of a factual indicator. Do we have in this document that we need to look and see how the COVID has repositioned? Vermont, just just as a, 
a question that needs to be answered. What can we expect to be different about our state compared to other states as a result of what what we've all gone, what this, the country's gone through? What's I different think, about our state and how can we act upon that? I think what the question, Mark, that you just answered for me um, needs to be in the upfront as Tim asked. So, in a positive I think, way. I, I think that we ought to lead up, how is the COVID change the world in the way we position ourselves and that ought who to can, be right up front in the document. Who can, who, is, who can tell us some things about the answers to that question that are more than just the anecdotal things that the individuals bring to it or, yeah. yeah. I think it might be too early to answer that question, but. Um, it's not too early to, to have someone looking for the answer. It's not too early to ask it for sure, but it might be too early to answer it. Um, can I just go back to one thing that Alice said in the in the higher education? Uh, just before we do, I just want to make sure, uh, Senator McDonald, that Luke has a good understanding of what Senator McDonald is, is looking for. No, I do not. Okay, so every, it's not Luke. every time you we all fifty states come out of a crisis or an event or whatever, we never come out the same, something always changes. As a result of this virus, what are the unique changes that Vermont might expect that might be different than in New York or Maine or anywhere else? What, do, what does that bring to us? What does it take away from us? And we and need to again, I think get on that sense. soon. Yeah, is asking it as a question in the beginning, uh, sort of in that, as we start to lay out, as Tim was looking for, you know, this is why we were given this direction. This is what we're trying to do, um, that kind of thing. Here's a question, you know, what, how would one of the, qu you know, questions that we need to have answered is how will Vermont be different and what kinds of things might we be positioned to do differently moving forward? So that would go, Luke, in the beginning of that of that document. That's, and I'm happy to talk to you later about that and work with you on that. Senator Campion, this is Joyce again. So I've been keeping track of all of the New England states in terms of uh, COVID cases and testing and death rates and so forth and so on since back in early March. So if if that kind of quick overview of how Vermont is faring in terms of COVID uh, disease, um, if, if that sort of thing would help. I, I, I have actual data on that. Um, that, that and sorry? That, that's, we, we, have, that's, we have data. We read in the paper. People in the rest of the nation are reading in the paper. Um, the, this is, I think it was Digger a couple of weeks ago was doing an interview of home sales and home sales were showing a, a spike that was newsworthy and people were questioned about why they were buying homes. And um, that is a change that has taken place as a result of this COVID. What other similar changes can we anticipate or are being documented or provide opportunities? Our transition report ought to say we ought to take a look at these, we ought to understand them, and we ought to be ready to be nimble or um, anticipate them. So that was longer than I intended, but. Sure, sure. So I would yeah. say we start with the data. We talk about the density of population. We talk about uh, the increased ability to work from home and, and uh, you know, how it becomes more attractive for people to live in Vermont if they have broadband access yeah. uh, and can telecommute and so forth. So I, I think there could be a, a good argument made there. Joyce, would you no mind? Uh, needs right to be to assembled to make any good arguments that might be available. Yeah, and I think Joyce's language just now, if you're, would you would be willing to just put that in a couple of paragraphs for us, Joyce, and share it with sure. you? That would be great. Yes. Thank you yes, very much. You know, the other day, the um, Agency of Commerce and Community Development 
released a map that showed cases in Vermont and then cases in the region based on how many per million there are people there are, whatever it might be. But Vermont just looks really clear and clean compared to the other states. I mean, putting that map out to people who are considering where to go to college would be pretty, it'd be pretty dramatic. Do you want to send your kid to a place where there's hardly any cases of COVID-19 or somewhere else? Well, I, I absolutely agree with that, Anthony. And I think um, um, uh, um, a thoughtful parent, oh, um, you can drive here. If you were going to send your kid out to Colorado and- We, um, we know all that. Yes. Someone has to put the package, put it in, Together. in context. Yeah. I think Joyce's couple of paragraphs, I think that they'll be interesting to, to take a look at. I, I think she's, she's right on. Um, looking at the time, we only have three more hours together. Um, so, I have else, so I just don't want to. I... Anything else? Um, well, please. Not uh, uh, pass. Okay. Are Should we? In, in, I would. What's sorry. The plan again, what's the plan going forward? We, um, I, I would suggest to you that we need to, um, if we can get, uh, as soon as we can get um, these um, changes made, I think we're awfully close in this. And we need to get the document um, um, to um, Tim, and we need to get this done before the appropriations committee starts to work and before these reports start to come, this needs to be in front of that. And I think um, we particularly now with the housing piece, uh, what we say in this document about housing is don't just create units. We also need, it, it's something more than just the unit that you need to create. I think we need to get this document out and moving, and I think we're awfully close. I think so too, and I think it is turning into a, a you know a, a really strong document. So we'll look uh, for an email. Hopefully, <laughs> hope Ledge Council is busy, but we hope that foot we could see something today. We'll keep our fingers crossed, and then um, we probably. Unless someone disagrees, I think we should should just plan on meeting again tomorrow so we can wrap this up and continue to meet until we have this wrapped up. So let's plan on 730 tomorrow. That sounds good. Can and I just before you shut off, I had a couple of questions, please. Yeah, and I just yeah, have... let's make sure Luke understands what yeah. we're asking him to do. Also, can I just raise an issue that you might want to be thinking about in the healthcare thing if they aren't already, I'd like to know. In this education piece, uh, someone mentioned or it's in here. Um, providing support, doing, uh, consider liability protection for institutions of higher ed. Okay, so that's one thing to think about. I'm wondering, is someone in healthcare thinking about doing that for nursing homes? I'm not saying we should or shouldn't, but is someone looking at that? That's going on, I think, in a couple of other states because of all the COVID cases at them. Anyway, go ahead. I'm good. Well, um, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, is the right. short answer. <laughs> right. Right. So it's not a whole. Yep. Luke, how are you feeling? So I mean, about the document and, and being able to, you know, any outstanding question. So I had a couple of questions. Uh, so number one, there's discussion of having the present pro Tim submit introductory language. Are you circling back to him? Uh, or... I want would, to write I, I, introductory language. I'll text the um, president pro tem this Great. morning. Do you want this put back on letterhead? It doesn't matter. I mean, once we sign off on it, it can go back on letterhead. So Do you want everyone to sign independently, the signature lines, or just sort of sincerely working group, sort of a general Oh, I closing? think we should have everyone's signature. Okay. Think about the mechanics of having that happen i don't have a great answer for you that's just sign it so so because it becomes an issue of he has to get our signature right i think it would be all right if um tomorrow we got the sign off from every member that we you just print our names yeah, yeah. that's fine yeah i think okay. so too yeah that's fine okay. and there's, once there's, i have it uh senator ingram 
Well, it just there's software that makes it really easy for a bunch of people to sign a, a document. We we use, it's called DocuSign. Well, anyway, it's <laughs> but I know we're very low tech in the <laughs> in the government. Um, but anyway, that, that's probably a minor point. I, ahead, I I I love your idea, Dan, but um, but at this point, um, we need to get names in as long as everybody says yes. Yeah. Okay. But a good point. Send the new draft to everyone. Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. Um, so I'll work on that. Once again, please continue to check your email. It, I don't know when I'll get it done, but I will work on it. But do please continue to check your email. What I may do on this version, if there's something that's contradictory or not resolved, I may highlight that and have a little question right. in the text to make it easier for you to focus on that. But otherwise, I think what you've said is fairly clear and I'm ready to go. Great. Thank you all for your patience. So your we're on tomorrow then at 7 7.30. I think this, yeah. Um, I've, uh, anything else uh, from my co-chair, Senator Westman? Do you want to do a shout out or anything from the northern part of the state? No, I think um, we're good. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you all tomorrow and hopefully we'll sign. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. And again, Bye. Okay.